Thankful again for everyone's presence this afternoon to our second service of the Lord's Day. And Gerald, thank you so much for that prayer. So thankful for you and being able to have you back and be involved the way you are. We're thankful for that tonight. We're continuing our series, as he mentioned in the prayer, on frequently asked questions. And this is one that centers around the issue, the vice of gambling. And so we phrased it this way, is there a biblical reason not to gamble? And so as we start out, we'll notice just in a few moments that one would search the Bible in vain, you know, for a verse that explicitly says, you shall not gamble. We just don't find that. Well, how do we reason? How do we deal with something like that when we have a topic or something like this that is not specifically stated with that word. And we're going to see that in our lesson tonight. And the handout, and I appreciate those who helped hand out the, the reasons that the Bible condemns gambling, as we'll define it here in just a moment. But we'll look at those. That's the last part of our lesson tonight. But it was really too many points to put on slides and so I thought, well, a handout will be good. So you can take that home, think over it, look up those passages even more. What are the odds of winning the Powerball? It has been stated in research that the odds of winning the Powerball jackpot are 1 in 292 million. And so experts break that down, and they say it's more likely to be struck by lightning once than to win the Powerball even if you played every drawing during a lifetime. So there's that. <laughs> Not much hope in that, is there? To invest your time and your hard-earned money in that. We know that we will not find a verse that specifically forbids, and someone has pointed this out, arson or abusing drugs or kidnapping or counterfeiting. Same thing with gambling, but we're going to notice tonight there are a lot of Bible principles and general teachings that do apply to this topic. And I think after we look at the body of evidence that the Bible brings up regarding principles of why we should avoid and not engage in this sinful practice, it would be enough to convince us and, and to realize we need to stay away from it. As we look into it, we know that it's a socially harmful vice. It has been stated that the largest number of gamblers come from some of the poorest segments of the population. And this is worldwide, no matter what country you look into. The existence of gambling businesses leads to an addiction on a large percentage of the population. That addiction has been traced and studied out that it destroys marriages, it destroys families, it destroys careers and jobs, and it increases a breakdown in our society. And just that reason alone, we know then we're not contributing to the betterment of society if we engage in a vice that's actively working to destroy our society and our culture. We know that studies have shown, and this has gone on a long period of time, where gambling, where it's established, the crime rate increases. And so there's a lot of things just in general that we know right offhand that are not benefits. They, they don't benefit society. It doesn't help the family. It doesn't help our careers. It's something that's addictive. And so even just on those points, it would be something to definitely stay away from. As we think about defining gambling, there are some who will say, well, you know, gambling is just anything that involves chance. But when you start looking at a specific definition of gambling, or several different ones, you realize that's not really a true statement. That's too general. It's too generic. It's too much of a generalization that everything in life is gambling, or anything that involves chance is gambling. It's true that gambling does involve risk, it involves chance, but that's not a complete definition of it. Webster says it's to play a game for money or property, to bet on, notice, an uncertain outcome. 
The World Book Encyclopedia says gambling is betting the out, on the outcome of a future event. Gamblers usually bet money or something else of value as a stake on the outcome they predict. When the outcome is settled, the winner collects the loser's stakes. That gives us some insight. So what we're talking about is, is more than just anything in life, and it's, it, doesn't, it goes beyond just anything that involves chance. Yes, there's chance and risk, but notice that there is something that is at stake. People are putting something into this. And whenever the outcome is settled, there's a winner and there's a loser. And as we go through this lesson tonight, think about that. If I'm going to enter into this vice, what's my goal? My goal is to win, isn't it? And in a sense, by implication, I'm saying I do not want the other parties that are participating to win. I want them to lose because I want to take home whatever has been put up, whatever there is to win. Keep that in mind as we study through this and keep that as, as a thought. I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. Is that my goal in life? To go through life and to make sure that I'm always, you know, I'm going into this with a greediness and with a way that I'm going to win and I want my neighbor to lose or my fellow person in society to lose. As we think about it being defined, Properly defined, gambling is wagering something of value on the chance outcome of an event where there is a winner and a loser. So as someone might say, well, you know, nearly everything in life is gambling. And sometimes they'll say that, you know, buying or selling stock or farming or starting a business or buying insurance or, you know, drawing straws or flipping a coin. But it's, again, as we've noticed, it's more than that because there's the elements we have to look at. There's an uncertain event that's been arbitrarily determined. Then there's a stake. There's something that's wagered. There's a bet that is deliberately chanced. And then at the outcome, at the end, there's a winner and there's a loser. And so the real issue is we're risking what is, risking what is yours in order to get what belongs to another with nothing given in return. And so the goal is, I want to obtain what is someone else's. And so think of that again with the backdrop that I'm a Christian, I'm a child of God, I'm striving to live my life in an honest way, in an upright way, the way of Christ, and yet I'm going to participate in something that I'm hoping and... <laughs> You know, just my goal is that they're going to lose and I'm going to win. We've got to remember that there's Bible teaching with a number of these things. And there I mentioned, you know, the idea risking what is yours in order to get what belongs to another with nothing given in return. But isn't the real issue here, couldn't we say it's covetousness? Couldn't we say it's greed, idolatry, as the Bible reminds us? And so the idea is, Thayer in his Greek-English lexicon said, the idea of covetousness is eager to have more, especially what belongs to another. That defines gambling, doesn't it? Because that's why I'm in it. I want to win. I'll put up something, but I want to, win. I want to be the winner. I want them, the other people, the other person to be the losers in this. And so it's a desire to gain without giving something of equal value. We do this at the expense of someone else. And so we're willing for others to lose all of their time and effort and money in order for me to win. But the very spirit of gambling, and I think we could stop our lesson here tonight and go home and have a biblical reason to oppose gambling. It's covetousness. In Colossians 3 and verse 5, Paul said, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. Notice then he adds on to that, covetousness, which is idolatry. And then in Ephesians 5 and verse 5, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure 
or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, Paul there said, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, or men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But he mentions idolaters. Paul had tied together covetousness and idolatry. And then he also mentions the greedy in 1 Corinthians 9, or 1 Corinthians 6. And so covetousness, that eagerness to have more, especially what belongs to another, that's greed, isn't it? We want more, we desire to have more. And we'll notice one of the points in our list is being content with what we have. And so God says, be content. Do you have enough to eat and, and you have shelter and you, you have all the basic necessities of life? And yet we look at people that, want to get into gambling. They want to play the Powerball and the lottery and all of these different things. And the idea really at the bottom of, of that is they're greedy, they're covetousness. They have covetousness in their life. They're eager to have more. And so there's self-control involved in that, isn't there, as we think about that. And so when we think about gambling violates biblical principles, and that's how we've started. Gambling is motivated by a covetous desire. And so let's look through some of these quickly tonight. We're not going to take a long time. You have the outline there. But beginning with having a covetous desire that I really believe, there it is. And as we defined it originally in the original text, that's against gambling and it condemns it very clearly. But what about encouraging laziness and destroying the work ethic? Proverbs 18 and verse 9 says, Whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. Also in Proverbs, in chapter 28 and verse 22, a stingy man hastens after wealth and does not know that poverty will come upon him. So we have warnings, don't we? Throughout the Bible, especially in the Old Testament and the book of Proverbs. But in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, Paul said, you know, for even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. And so we know there's a segment of our society in people. They don't want to work. They're lazy. They, they want someone else to supply their needs. They're able to work, but they don't want to work. They don't have any work ethic. And so this reminds us of these passages, and certainly gambling would be something that would would be in their vision, wouldn't it? As they would find out about that and think, well, look, I can just pay a little bit and look at what potentially I can win. And yet, as we noticed earlier, you're going to be at this probably your whole life and not walk away with anything worthwhile. But it's a, a desire to just have this lazy lifestyle. Notice gambling destroys our love for our neighbor. I, I think this is another strong Bible point as we think about getting into this. And as you would go down to whatever store it would be and, or go online or however you're doing this and you're participating in that betting process or buying that ticket or, or whatever you're doing, you're again going up against your neighbors, your community people, fellow citizens of the country, and you don't have really any love for your neighbor because you want to take from your neighbor. Paul said, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Wouldn't it be better to take what we're thinking about going and participating in this vice and going and doing some good with it to serve someone, help someone, buy them a meal, help them in some way that they need help rather than going and wasting it and throwing it to the wind? but it destroys our love for our neighbor. We really don't have, we can't say, I love my neighbor if I want them to lose and I want to take from them. Notice it, it destroys our influence for good. Matthew 5 and verse 14, 
We remember that we're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. If I'm engaging in something that I'm eager to take from someone else, and I'm covetous, I'm, I'm greedy, wow, what an example that is. That's not an influence for good. It's going to probably destroy my life and my family and my job and my influence for good. We're to be the light of the world. And so this would not be among something that is involved in a Christian's life. Notice gambling also divides one's allegiance. In Matthew 6 and verse 24, we know a lot of things could be put under this, but notice here Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Well, that hits to the heart of that too, doesn't it? I mean, isn't it amazing that it, it, even though there's a, not a verse that says you shall not gamble or do not play the lottery, all of these come into play. You can't serve God and money. And if you're gambling and you have that covetous desire, you're eager for more, and you want to be the winner over someone else, you certainly don't love them. But it divides our allegiance. We're to serve Christ. We're to do good in His name and use everything that we have in His benefit. Notice gambling leads to other sins. Mentioned earlier about the crime rate, and you, you think about the scams and the the corruption that is always involved in surrounding casinos and, and areas of gambling. And people are always you know, taking from that that are involved and maybe handle the funds and you find out this one was skimming off of here and this one was stealing out of here. And there's all sorts of you know, crime that it goes hand in hand with. Other vices are popular with this particular vice. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 13, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And then Jesus reminds us in Matthew 7, 16, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. Well, if I'm corrupt in heart, if I'm greedy, if I'm covetous, and I want what's not mine, I want someone else's, and I'm eager to earn more in that way, notice how I'm going to be known by my fruit. But as Jesus states, if that's at the core, then I'm just going to produce sinful things, other things that are opposed to God and His will. Notice number seven, that gambling seeks to get something for nothing, which again is contrary to God's will. If we look at Ephesians 4 and verse 28, the Bible says, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. That's a powerful verse, isn't it, to remind us of our, our individual responsibility. God, back in Genesis chapter 3, did He not state that in a very clear principle regarding our labor and our work and that it falls upon all of us to work and support ourselves, support our spouse, support our families, but also, as Paul says here, also God's work and, and serving other people that, that has a need. But if think about that. If, if I'm squandering what I've got, trying to get something for quote-unquote nothing, putting in a little and wanting a big return. And I think about these verses of, of having this to share with someone else. Well, I've already squandered that. I, I don't have that to share with anyone else. I can't help my neighbor who needs a meal. I can't help some child in the community that needs some clothing or needs some medical care or whatever that would be. That's all gone. Proverbs 28 and verse 20, it says, A faithful man will abound with blessings, but whoever hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. And so we're reminded, aren't we? This idea of getting something for nothing is contrary to God's will. Gambling is also a habit-forming practice that destroys self-control. 
And that was also listed. And you can pull up many, many news stories. Some of the first things you'll find in studies, you know, are that, you know, people lose their self-control and they allow this, uh, this to be, you know, their addiction and their, their God, if you will. That's all they live for. And that they have to try to fill that every day. In 2 Timothy 3 and verse 3, the idea of those who are without God in their life, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good. And so we're, we know from other passages, Galatians 5 and a lot of places, we must have self-control. We need to work on that and develop that continually in our lives and and know who we are, know what we're about, and know that I need to stay away from that. If that's a temptation, I shouldn't go there. I need to have the control and the discipline and, and stay in God's Word and pray and get help from others if I need to, to stay away from these sinful vices. Gambling teaches that the end justifies the means. And so while we know a lot of state lotteries and things over the years, you know, they've tried to come up with a way, well, if we, if we put this into practice, we need to be able to sell it. We need to sell it to the people. And so the idea early on was, well, this state lottery is going to benefit the children. It's going to benefit our kids. And we're going to be able to build schools and equip those schools. And the idea is there, the, the argument they're using is the end justifies the means of how to get it. And so look at how then that contributes, as we've already noticed, to the downfall of our society, of our community, of our state when that's enacted. Because now we're encouraging everybody, go play the Powerball, go buy the lottery tickets, go spend all your money, extra money for that, knowing full well that you're more likely to be struck by lightning than to ever win that Powerball if you played it all of your days. And so we see the deception that's out there, even in the leaders in our states and our country and, and different places. It's sad, isn't it? In Romans 3 and verse 8 on that point, and why not do evil that good may come? Paul asks that as a question. As some people slanderously charge us with saying their condemnation is just. And so Paul was condemning that idea of the end justifies the means. We realize it's sin, it's a vice, it's against God, it's against our neighbor, and all of these other points. Um, it does not justify what the outcome would be, even though that might be a good cause. The way to get it is not right. What about gambling, misplacing our trust in God's provisions? Do we trust God? Don't we pray to God daily as a Christian, you know, for supplying our needs, our food, the food that's on our table, the clothes that we wear, an opportunity to work, to support our family and to give to God and to help our neighbor in time of need. Proverbs 30, beginning in verse 8, the Bible says, Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. And so aren't we blessed and shouldn't we trust God and His providing for us rather than thinking, well, you know, if I'm going to have this, I've got to go out and gamble for it, knowing full well it's never going to work that way like we think. But rather than we're wasting, aren't we, the provisions that God has given us if we go down that road. Notice how gambling often joins people with evil companions. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, where we know, do not be deceived, bad company ruins good morals. And so here you have people who are engaging in the same sinful things and they are all come from different places and they have other sinful things they want to be involved in. They're going to influence you to, to run with them, be with them, participate with them. We know, we know how powerful the relationships we have can be. And we have to be careful, don't we, to choose 
the proper right relationships and friendships. I've already mentioned regarding the addictive nature of gambling. And, um, you know, it cracks me up. I, it, it shouldn't, and I, I shouldn't, we shouldn't make light of that. But a lot of the advertising, what does it say? Gamble responsibly. And it's like, it's, and they say that with drinking too, don't they? Drink responsibly. How do you do that? <laughs> There's no good way to do that. That's, that's a joke, isn't it? But that's, they're trying to, you know, uh, save themselves, I guess. Knowing full well. Why would you have to put that warning on there? Because it's going to lead people down a terrible path to lose what they have. And all of these other points that we've noticed, they're not going to trust God. They're, they're going to waste the blessings that God has given them. But people go back and they go back, and, and this is the design of that very industry, isn't it? That's billions and billions and billions of dollars a year because people cannot break their addiction to that. In Romans 6 and verse 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? Well, if I give myself to whatever vice that is, I'm a slave to that. I've given myself over to it. And Paul goes on to say, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. And then what about gambling destroying homes and family? We mentioned that earlier, and that's in the stati statistics all the time. Families are broken up. And you see that here's, here's you know, the father or maybe the mother, and they get their paycheck, and they go to buy lottery tickets. They go to play the Powerball. They try to gamble it some way. When that food needs to be used to feed their family, clothe their family, supply the needs that their children have and their spouse has. But yet, this is what they do. They're obedient to that. They're slaves to that sin, to that vice. And so then it's going to destroy their family. We're reminded over in 1 Timothy 5, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household. He has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's strong, isn't it? That's a strong, powerful statement to remind us of our duty, of our responsibility to take care of our family, not squander our resources, not waste what God has blessed us with for selfish gain and also to steal from my neighbor. Gambling violates faithful stewardship. Paul said, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful, 1 Corinthians 4.2. Again, a reminder, what God has given us, how do we use that? Do we use it to his glory for what he has stated? Okay, you support yourself, support your family, so, you know, help your neighbor, help someone in need. Support the church as we're to do each first day of the week and beyond that as well. But using what God's given us to bless others. And then finally, gambling encourages discontent in life. It's another strong point, I think, that goes along with the idea of covetousness. But 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 6. Paul says there, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction kind of sums up in general what we've talked about tonight, isn't it? Not only is there an eagerness to have more, which is sinful in our heart with covetousness, which Paul said is idolatry, but we're not living a content life as a Christian. He said, if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But it's largely all the stuff after that, isn't it? Where we're not content. 
and I want this, and I want that, and I want these things, and I want this much. And then that causes us to go beyond, and then we live a life of misery every day because I'm not content with being fed and clothed and I have a job, but I want all these other things that, you know, incidentally, most of that's it's not necessary for life, isn't it? And I think that's what Paul was saying. Be content with the basic necessities of life, knowing you can get by, knowing that you can live your life in full obedience to God, but it's largely these other things that we're constantly, that are advertised in front of us. And we desire that. We're eager to have more. And then it will a lot of times lead people down the path to gamble. But notice there, those that desire to be rich, they're eager for more. They fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires. Wouldn't that as well describe gambling? And realizing that the odds are we're never really going to be successful with that. Besides the fact that we violate some 15 at least Bible principles in engaging in the vice of gambling. Psalm 62.10, we'll close with that. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. And so we realize a lot of things come into play, materialism, greed, covetousness, and then all these other thoughts that we've shared tonight. Reminders that as a Christian, this should not be in my life. I should not desire it. I should not participate in it if I want to live the faithful Christian life. As a Christian, aren't we called to live above the world, the way the world lives? And as John the Apostle said in 1 John 2, don't love the world. You know, don't participate in those things of the world that are, and he's saying, that are against God, that violate God's word, and that destroy our influence and our integrity and our example and our faithfulness. Let's live above that. Don't lower the bar, but let's excel to a higher standard of living that honors our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Tonight, as we think about things, and you know, primarily as we think about this issue tonight, it boils down to sin, doesn't it? And we realize sin separates us from God. Sin causes us to not be able to have a right relationship with God, and so we need to take care of our sins. Tonight, are you with us and you realize you've never done that? You've never made the steps or taken the steps to be a Christian and we realize that the door is always open, day or night, whatever time you come to the conclusion that based upon my study and my faith, I know I need to obey God. I need to be a child of God. I want my sins washed away. Can we assist you tonight by helping immerse you in in? to Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins based upon your faith and repentance. Maybe you just need prayer. You need encouragement for something that's going on in your life or maybe you've been unfaithful. Whatever that reason is, won't you make it right tonight with God as we stand and as we sing?